Right now, I'm editing a conversation with Dr. Hart, and I love it. He is a brilliant man, and I'm so honored to have him on my channel. If you don't know his work, I would implore you to Google his name, David Bentley Hart, look at his books, read some of his articles. He has a lot of great work that he shared for free, and also he has a lot of great work that you can purchase. There's a couple times in this conversation where I was lost <laughs> because he's brilliant and uh, I struggle keeping up. And if you feel the same way, uh, you're not alone. And if you would like to have further com conversations about this, maybe unpacking what he said, feel free to email me anytime at hargonw at gmail.com and I'll be sure to get back to you. And remember that this is an ongoing conversation. So we don't have the last words, but our words, especially Dr. Hart's words, are significant and important. So thank you for listening and thank you for hearing us out. Dr. Hart, uh, I want to, first of all, thank you so much for your time and for your willingness to have a discussion with me. I'm very excited for this conversation. Um, your work has been so important with those that I identify themselves with the Christian faith. So uh, to, to share this conversation is, is a gift, and I thank you for that. And um, so um, the, the title of my podcast is called um, um, Lilies and Conversations. And so what I try to do, I try to give people flowers. Are you familiar with that term? It's like a maybe a pop cultural term. Um, yeah, I'm probably I'm probably too old to be familiar <laughs> with the idiom, but uh, okay. you know. So the the term is uh, it's, it's, the whole idea is trying to give people their praise and their honor before they pass away, because you know usually when someone passes away, there's a casket <laughs> and you're putting, you're putting flowers on the casket. A bit right? like Have you heard rumors of it? <laughs> no, no. Like, Place. No, no, no. It's, I mean, I, I, I interview someone my age too. So it's just the whole idea is just to let someone know how much you appreciate them and their work and their life before, you know, there's a, a separation. Before the Grim Reaper calls. I mean, let's, let's be, let, let's yeah. be talking. That's right. It is going to happen eventually. So um, I got that, a couple that, things. Go ahead. Those bony knuckles come knocking at the door. E exactly. So I got a couple things I have written but, for but, you. But before you ask them, that's, okay. that's why I've installed a camera doorbell device in the front of my house. So if the Grim Reaper does come, I have advance warning and I can see it. <laughs> You're going to see it coming. That's right. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's an age of miracles and wonders, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. I like All right. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a couple praises. Okay. So you have to endure me just giving you some praises and then we'll get I, I can handle our, it. our conversation. Okay. Very good. I'll steal myself against it. <laughs> well, the, the first praise I want to give you is that you are a no fluff. I'm sorry. I dropped something. You are a no fluff and a no BS writer. And I appreciate that. Um, you, you tell it like it is. And I believe your honesty and your bluntness is, is important. And um, I think it's almost like prophetic. And a lot of my, some of my African American friends, they 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 preach like you write, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I, I really appreciate. It does that. actually. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And um, another praise I have is that you had you have an illuminating perspective on American Christianity, um, with a cultural commentary that is familiar. Like I said, this is. These are some of the words and some of the the thoughts and some of the concerns that I, I've heard preached from the pulpit as a lot of my African-American churches that I've been a part of. So it's a beautiful thing. And I, I appreciate that. And then lastly, um, your work has been effective at challenging readers to reevaluate uh, the current states of faith and spirituality. And I think in turn, urging us to have a deeper engagement with the truths of, of the Christian faith. And uh, it's been beautiful. I appreciate your work. And I appreciate the fact that as I engage with your work, I, I can develop a spiritual depth, I think. And also, um, I think I can be more more, more of integrity um, as I'm trying to consult the, the faith and consult um, how I can um, you know, parse out Christian faith in, in my own life. So I, I appreciate that. And I, I just wanted to thank you for your work and let you know that you are, you are changing lives and tra trajectories, whether you are aware of that or not. And I hope you... Well, I'm aware of it now. <laughs> That's a very kind of you, I would mm. say. Mm -hmm. um, now I have to do my best to appear graceful. <laughs> um, just be you. That, that's, all, that's all I ask. Just be just, yourself. Uh -huh. Yeah, all right. Well, that, that might be the last thing one should encourage me to do, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, to start the conversation, um, in your essay, uh, The Myth of America, 
Uh, you speak of America's complicity with white, suprem white supremacy. Is that, I, I don't know which, which essay you mean. I, 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 maybe I'm forgetting the title. It's the, uh, the myth of America. So it's a, I think it's an online essay that's available. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, and you've written so I've, much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've written, yeah, it's true. I have over, yeah. uh, I think 2000 articles out there. In one yeah. Book, uh, but, I, but, uh, or columns, I, I, uh, it could be also that the title was given by the publication. In oh yeah. So uh, I, I myself am unaware of the title. Yeah. So. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the quote in the the article is that complicity with um white. Well, you you said complicity with white supremacy. I think you're in ref, in reference to the the American church. Um, so my the question I had is how do you see this complicity manifesting within American Christianity? And the complicity is the the white supremacy some um, complicity. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um again, I don't remember the article. I don't even remember mm -hmm. the quote, but I'm I'm fully on board with the sentiment, so I'm glad uh -huh. I voiced it somewhere. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, of, of course, I mean, I think that um, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that here, as in every country, historically, the, the, uh, the institutional supports of society have been more about, quite often more about supporting the social structures, the economic structures, the class mm -hmm. structures, and here especially, but but in other places as well, the race structures, racial mm -hmm. structures that exist, and only secondarily uh, about faithfulness to the principles mm. that are putatively espoused. So yeah, I mean, in a sense, it's almost a truism to say that that the the forms of of American piety that grew up willing to live beside, well, first of all, obviously slavery, but thereafter. Uh, a radically unjust distribution of 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 both concrete goods and social goods uh -huh. based on race as well as on class uh, yeah. is already um, complicity. And uh, but more than that, of course, uh, I, I think we've seen very sobering evidence in recent years that that that. Uh, I mean, I, my temptation is to say the white evangelical church mm -hmm. supremely, but but as we see, the the culture of white evangelicalism, which I see as inherently a post-Christian movement, I have to be mm -hmm. honest, I see it as something mm -hmm. that comes in the wake of Christianity. It's not a legitimate expression of the tradition so much mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. what has come about as the result of a collapse of Christian principles in the mm -hmm. history of Western modernity end of this country, but but that it's not just located there. This that same ethos has moved into Catholicism and into Orthodoxy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in the latter case, to a great extent, because of just the sheer number in recent years of converts from the white evangelical world into Orthodoxy, except they're not really converting to the ancient tradition they think they're converting to so much as they're converting that tradition to a to a version of white evangelicalism uh -huh. plus plus incense but anyway i'm already going off on a tangent here the, the point is is that yeah the the i think that uh, we have a long and indurated history one that's coming to the surface again now in mm -hmm. this election season we see it again fully on display mm -hmm. in which uh structures of racial injustice social injustice uh, ally themselves to um a kind of apocalyptic religious consciousness that's uh -huh. that's, a, that's particularly american that calls itself christianity yeah. uh but that is arguably some some entirely novel religious configuration that that, that is no more christian than it is american Mm. Let me let me say since you, I, I'm sorry to take one question as as the occasion for following forth, but you know, in recent years there was all this hysteria among the sort of like the sort of people you see. On, the, well, I would say you see on Fox News, but I hope you don't watch Fox News. I, mean, I don't see them there. <laughs> yeah, I don't watch uh, any news. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, that'll keep you sane. Yeah, I like to read. I'll read articles or something. <laughs> what at, at your age? <laughs> Yeah, I I thought that you had to be over thirty five still. <laughs> well, no, um, 
but there was all this hysteria about critical race theory, right? You know, mm -hmm. it, that's having right. A, having it caricatured as a doctrine of of pervasive and inevitable uh, white complicity in uh, which, of course, is not what what critical race theory is. I mean, criti mm. critical race theory, just as a, as an academic doctrine, was this um, loose amalgam of certain very serious attempts in some cases you know what it was ideas of people like derek bell first loaded mm -hmm. that trying to understand the history of racism mm -hmm. in america or let's say in american christianity if you're just trying to boil it down to personal prejudice then of course if that were the case the problem would be easily solved right mm -hmm. that's right because at the end of the day it's not the case that the vast majority of people are consciously racist uh -huh. they just aren't i mean that's not true i mean the very the same people who are going on november are going to go to the ballot box and vote for donald trump mm -hmm. who represents an inherently uh authoritarian and and in many ways racist movement in american politics are going to do it not out of any personal animus. They might they might have in their family mixed marriages and have no mm -hmm. problem with it. That's not the problem. Um, it's the problem that there are enduring structures that have an, uh, a historical basis that we're not willing that they're not willing to look at critically. Mm. Wow. And the complicity lies not at the level of of, of personal malice, personal malevolence, personal. Mm -hmm. per, uh, personal prejudice again there's some of that there's quite a lot of that but it's still not it's still not the dominant force that mm -hmm. perpetuates um the structures of power that we know and and the, and the inequity the racial inequity that, that we see in the distribution of 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 power property privilege so on. Uh -huh. it really is that that they're embedded within systems and within histories uh, that seem to them to be con to be nothing other than nature itself, mm -hmm. and they're not willing to, to see the degree to which they 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 contribute. Or we, all of us, I shouldn't say they. Yeah. I mean, all of us uh -huh. contribute to sustaining these structures in place, uh, mostly because we're not willing to take a, a a deeply critical and moral look at them exactly right wow and as you say that I, I thought about just the refusal to acknowledge this question or deal with this question like how do we get here <laughs> like how do we get here and if you know whether or not where we are is where sh we should be <laughs> does that make sense uh, do you think that's that's part of the issue not wrestling with that question yeah no i mean look i mean th there's been an active there's an active effort to suppress memory mm -hmm. And I say, and I'm, again, it's not just on the conservative side. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not a liberal in the American uh -huh. sense. I'm, I'm, say, broadly speaking, a man of the left, and that I'm mm -hmm. a socialist in my my general view of things. A Christian, I'm in the Christian socialist tradition, the British Christian socialist mm -hmm. tradition. Although that was full of Tories. I mean, it, you know, <laughs> when we try to break this down into right and left, it makes no sense in modern yeah. day. But, but I mean, I, I see the same. I mean, I see some degree of, of, on the, the, you know, the liberal side too, to mm -hmm. uh, not to deal with history honestly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But but at the moment, I think we know we're the greatest force of of, of um, uh, ideological suppression of the past. Mm -hmm. Is is going? You know, the things they don't want taught in school books. They don't mm -hmm. want to the way they don't want the Civil War to be taught. You That's know? right. And and mm -hmm. in a way. And there's a kind of desperation and a kind of anxiety in the sense that, you know, I don't want to bear the blame. Mm. But bearing the blame and bearing the responsibility are two very different things. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we, we're, we're responsible for one another, not necessarily because we're personally culpable for everything that, 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 that conduces to the harm of others. We're, mm -hmm. You know, I am I'm my brother's keeper, not, be, not, not because I've necessarily personally uh conspired to wrong my brother the responsibility mm -hmm. uh pre-exists any historical failures any yeah. mm -hmm. nonetheless the suppression of memory uh is it's one of the most insidious aspects mm -hmm. of 
this movement that we see wow. gathering on the. And we'll just look at America. Let me give you an example about you know the preservation of structural inequity unexamined, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you will you, you, throughout the the post slavery period, the post Civil War period. Mm-hmm. While black Americans were seeking to establish equality, to achieve equality, to achieve redress of injustice, to adequate protection under the law, adequate mm-hmm. protection of their lives and their 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 property and mm-hmm. and opportunities, okay. White Americans were being given lines well, not of equality but real equity, that is in the sense of building up um generational wealth uh-huh that's right uh, the homestead act one of the one of the uh great acts that that enlarged the number of property owners people who had generational wealth to pass on except those black americans were excluded from the benefits of the homestead act mm-hmm. except in very sporadic and very local ways the that's new right. deal the new deal okay um m- that was very uh, let's, let's simply say um, inconsistently applied. Uh-huh. The benefits that the New Deal extended to Americans were extended only to some Americans fully. Yeah. Even the GI Bill of Rights, the sort mm. of the, the sort of uh, the sort of assistance available, even just securing loans for owning homes and things like that, again applied uh, with you know vast. Uh, vast differences of actual availability, actual mm-hmm. access, and then, of course, you know, then even w- w- when property could be acquired, what would, would constitute generational wealth? We had things like redlining, and mm-hmm. so the result is is that um, that the person doesn't want to look at this history and say, "Well, but you know." everybody in this country has the same rights mm. everybody yeah. has the same opportunities uh but not everyone has the same history mm. and, and and who you are in the present can, you know first of all you know say they have the same rights and rights say well do they do they have the same access um, mm-hmm. to, to legal protections all that's right that's arguable mm-hmm. what's clearly the case though is that the sort of even the lower white middle class person of today has what he or she has in a place in society or what security. And I'll admit the middle class in general has been disappearing because, mm-hmm. we, because of the system. I mean, one of the reasons we see the MAGA movement are on the rise is because of the collapse of a solvent middle class. Yeah. It, it, that's really a middle class. I mean, like below a household income of 400,000 a year, which really doesn't qualify as middle class. Mm-hmm. But you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I mean, lower levels, is, and and they have to blame someone, and mm. the people with the property and the power say, "Well, let's blame who is it going to be this time?" Ah, migrants. Mm. So, mm. so that's it. Of course, they're taking your job. Of course, they're not taking your jobs mm. because they they don't have the uh, the skills or the access. It's actually the jobs that are going away. But putting all that aside, what they have is nonetheless the effect of certain generations of material security spheres of social protection just mm-hmm. safer neighborhoods mm-hmm. um, that uh that whether they want to acknowledge it has to do with the fact that they're white yeah you know, that they had that their their parents their grandparents their great grandparents because that's how equity is built up we, we uh-huh. just, you don't have you don't have to have an inheritance you don't have to like my, my father left me 10 million dollars but you do have to be part of an a, a heritable social mm. economic structure with certain expectations certain institutions that function certain institutions that recognize and will serve you banks that will give you loans uh-huh um uh Places where you can you can buy a home, you know, and uh, w- w- without the price being suddenly being jacked up if mm-hmm. when you lose the property and you don't look there. So, I mean, uh, when we talk about structures, and this is what critical race theory 
uh, I, I'm overly simplifying, but it, you know, the, the the serious work of it was simply this. Uh, you know, it, it's funny that this hysteria has arisen about this, as if it's a, 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 an attempt to blame white people for everything, and, and that's unfair. It's, mm-hmm. it's not to say it's precisely the opposite for the most part. That it's it doesn't matter whether you yourself consciously dislike people of other races. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, you don't want black or Asian or Hispanic. You don't have to be that kind of person. Mm-hmm. But you are part of a, 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 a system, a social system, an economic system, a political system, and a religious. Uh huh. Yeah. To be honest, a religious system. That's system right. Man. How you understand what it means to be a Christian and to be uh-huh. responsible for one another. You know. Mm. Uh, mm. the, Can we the, unpack that different. further too? The religious <laughs> and how how one yeah. may see the gospel in light of <laughs> these these factors. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> you really you really do have to work hard to make the teachings of Jesus somehow consistent with an you know with with. Uh, the American economic system, mm-hmm. the American political system, the outright idolatry of uh, of uh, thing. Uh, have you ever? Do you know who's this um, white evangelical right way? Uh, Pastor Jeffers. Um, have you ever? I don't know his first name, but I've seen clips of his. You know, and it really is one of those things you see uh, in his sermons. simply conflating christ with america mm-hmm. and doing it doing it as if it, it does it never occurs to him that there's a problem here mm-hmm. um there to pulpit the cross is on one side the american flag mm-hmm. on the other you know which is yeah. itself already a um, problem well it's peculiarly i mean every every nation that has you know, within the history of Christendom, has had some sort of emblematic relationship between the the symbols of the nation and the symbols of the faith, but usually it hierarchically arranged so that the latter are in some way seen to be supreme over. Mm. Form. Not really the case in the great the great white American church. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes, um, great point, and. Uh, you realize that, that uh, so, and, and so much of white evangelical culture is displaced towards this apocalyptic, sort of fantastic reading of the world based on a very peculiar understanding of the book of Revelation, mm-hmm. which admittedly is not a book that there can be in a non peculiar understanding mm-hmm. of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But applied, uh, it, it, I mean, how, how I, I, to be honest, I mean, there are many, many uh, Americans, many white evangelical Americans who who think of America as a as a providential, even you know, a holy nation, a, uh, mm-hmm. a um, uh, having a special place in the history of humanity. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. Like that. But that means, of course, as is always the case. When when uh, you're making claims or or or, you know, or or simply making assumptions of that sort, is that you have to expurgate those aspects of the history that would relativize that judgment. Mm-hmm. You, know, you have to change. You, you can't allow memory to corrupt ideology. Uh-huh. Um, I'm sure I've gotten off the topic again already. Now you see the problem with interviewing me. <laughs> yeah, but no, you you brought up a lot of great points, especially um, that that point about the just the the idolizing of these two symbols of faith and nation, and and the conflation of the significance of both, right? And just even just the I think the distorted understanding of the gospel or the Christian faith, or even Jesus, right? Christ is America, and in some of these these perspectives, some of the the iconography of of, of certain conservative evangelical, which we actually have Christ carrying an AK. Mm, that's right, AR fifteen, whatever. Yep, and he's buff and jacked, and 
Oh yeah, yeah. He's, he, he's, a he, he, he's he's a mixed he he he's he's a mixed martial arts fighter in a cage. Uh -huh. He's a, he's got the flag way uh, the flag wrapped around him. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. and and he's got blue eyes generally. You know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I would say tawny blonde hair. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I, I mean, in a sense, America is, is, I mean, we are unique in uh -huh. a sense. There's no other nation in which, in which the corruption of, of Christianity in that direction, at least has gone to such ludicrous, almost cartoonish extremes. Mm. And it, it does make you wonder what it is about uh, the national temper, the nas the spirit of the nation, whatever you want to call it, uh -huh. that makes it possible so grotesquely to corrupt the gospel and not mm. realize, and not even, you know. I've heard, I've seen. Now, I will admit, I would point out that, that many of those who call themselves evangelicals this is especially true of, of white uh, white evangelicalism more and more has become a cultural designation more than anything else mm -hmm. this is one of those you know when, when these surveys are done, are done of, of faith there's a real difference in the meaning of words between, between how they're used in many minority communities and and what's becoming this sort of uh white cultural white isolationist or, mm -hmm. or white grievance culture i mean that 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 in uh, in in non-white language evangelicalism if someone says i'm an evangelical it generally means he or she actually goes to church and is mm -hmm. and, and um, whereas that's not def definite it's just generally more and more in in this this other world it's a sort of a cultural designation, sort of like the word Christian in Hungary. Mm. You know, the people who say, "Oh, they love Viktor Orban because he's fighting for Christian Hungary." No, well, <laughs> I mean, go to Hungary sometime and count mm. count the people in the pews. You're you're not, you know, it won't take two mm. hands. Mm. I mean, it's not. There's not a Christian country in any meaningful mm. sense. But but uh, for over a century, or Christianity in Hungary has just meant uh, a sort of white European identity. Yeah, mm -hmm. So that's all it means, a certain cultural identity. Um, and that same sort of uh, confusion between Christianity as a cultural identity and Christianity mm -hmm. as an actual practice of life in the light of mm -hmm. Jesus of Nazareth uh -huh. uh, has been taking shape in this country um, more and more explicitly, I think. Mm. And sorry. Yeah, so can you can you articulate what is the gospel according to Jesus of Nazareth, um, and not according to you know the the last. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm -hmm. so all this faith, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Uh, and on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's it's rather simple. He's uh, he's quite explicit in the mm -hmm. sermon on the mount and elsewhere. Uh -huh. You know, you you give freely to the poor, you denounce the injustice of those who cheat mm -hmm. the poor and, mm -hmm. and 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 would reduce them to poverty or indebtedness, mm -hmm. slavery. I mean, much of the the sermon on the mount, when you free it from our somewhat perfumed and abstract translations of uh -huh. the original Greek, is actually mm. very practical social advice mm -hmm. or on how to avoid being exploited by the powerful. Uh -huh. uh, you uh, you make peace. You, I mean, it's it's rather it's right there in the Beatitudes. <laughs> I mean, and you accept the radical statements he makes about wealth and poverty mm. they are not they are not judicious prudent um balanced statements mm -hmm. none of you who calls anything his own can be one of my disciples mm. now does that mean you can't have your own pair of shoes no mm -hmm. but if the first way to, but but it does mean that you can't accumulate vast wealth while while Lazarus is outside the gate, starving and covered with sores, mm. and still consider yourself a Christian. You mm -hmm. simply are not a Christian, even if you're, you know. But, but um, it, it does mean also that even your shoes, if your first thought about them is they're mine, mm. 
mm. rather than it's you know uh, you know that there might be I might find someone without shoes and if I want to be a Christian maybe I should give them my shoes to him you know mm. that possibility but you know um, is there's not a lot of ambiguity in the statement that it's easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye than for a rich uh -huh. person. Okay. We, we can, I mean, uh, you know, it, a lot of Christians down the centuries have spent a great deal of energy doing their 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 best to read that as stupidly as possible. Mm. You know, uh, one of the most effective ways of of reading it stupidly, of course, is the whole reformed. Uh, um, emphasis on grace rather than works, which is itself uh -huh. a misreading of Paul, a vast mm. misreading mm. of Paul. Paul does not say that you're saved by grace, not by works. He, he mm. says you're, you're, you're saved freely by grace, yes. Uh -huh. Not by, and the, and the word erga, ta erga is, is, is in, throughout the ancient the late late antique world it just means like uh, through religious observances um, mm. you know, through through uh, but uh you know he's quite clear that that faith pistis faithfulness mm -hmm. uh involves formidable uh social effort and and the sharing of goods and i mean wow. you, paul paul is quite clear about this it, it you 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 need good works but um but you can see like Calvin, when he uh, gives his interpretation of, of Christ talking to the rich man, rather than say, oh, Christ is, is stating clearly, unambiguously, that, um, that, uh, that, the rich, that the rich person, by virtue of being rich, is out of favor with God. There are poor people in the world. This man is rich. Mm. And that means that the way he lives is contrary to to the form of life that Christ says is the correct way to live, mm. right? Instead, what he says, well, Jesus was being ironical because the rich man was asking the wrong question: What can mm. I do to be saved? And Jesus was was explaining to him that oh, but it's not by works at all. It's it's a very this is I'm, I'm not making this up. This is very much part of the the tradition of totally inverting Christ's words. Wow. Based on a, a, 17, a 16th century uh, misreading of Paul, which admittedly has roots in much earlier misreadings of Paul. Um, uh, and well, I mean, you know, that's, that's <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a very much, a, a, it's rather uncomfortable actually to confront the explicit words of Christ. And of course, right. uncomfortable for everyone, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, because what counts as rich or poor, um, mm -hmm. it's a sliding scale. You know? Yeah, that's right. I may not be Jeff Bezos, but I won't mm. miss a meal today. Uh huh. Mm. And so, you know, it's not like any of us escapes the, uh, the command there, but you know, again, it's like when Christ says, Store not up treasure on earth. Store not up earthly treasure, but tre mm. you know, treasure. I mean, that's a command. Mm. I mean, that's not stated as I think it would be better for you spiritually if you focus <laughs> less on your material possessions. Uh, I mean, uh, those are fine. You know, you need an Xbox for the kids, <laughs> but it would be better if you thought more about heavenly things. So maybe, mm. in addition to going to church, maybe a Bible study in your basement once a week. That would be. Uh -huh. You know, that's not what he said. He was explicitly yeah. saying to his followers, "Do not store up earthly riches," mm. and the uh, because they are the opposite of, mm -hmm. of storing up riches in heaven. That's right. Wow. And um, that's and that's not something certainly that Americans are uniquely guilty of doing. That's the entire history of Christendom, isn't it? That mm -hmm. uh, as soon as Christianity ceased to be the way practiced by these rather disreputable dissidents at the margins of society, mm -hmm. or by you know curiously idealist merchants who were willing to give away the wealth that they had stored up over a generation or two, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it became instead the official creed first just by imperial favor then by imperial decree by the end of the fourth century it became the official cult of the, the empire from that period onward you had a, 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 a difficulty to deal with 
which was that this was a society based on a rigid hierarchy, not of, you know, not a hierarchy of mm-hmm. sacred functions. You know, it's like, well, some people are better at leading liturgy. Some people are better at, at uh, making sandals. You know, it wasn't that. It was, it was you know, one based upon uh, heredity, power, uh, wealth, uh, mm-hmm. violence, the power of the sword to subdue the uh, the the what well, you know subdue uh, a, a, any stirrings of resistance or complaint or dissatisfaction among those who mm-hmm. didn't have wealth you know mm-hmm. and um, you know so it's 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 always been part of Christian history is that Christ's teachings on wealth and on justice and on the essential oneness of all persons as children of the one father mm-hmm. in one household belonging to one race actually that's, that's cool. the thing yeah. you know, because, wow. I, I want to point that out because uh-huh, in, as you in should. the book of Acts chapter 17 verses 28 to 29 right the, um, the, the Paul on the Areopagus the word he uses he said we are God's offspring right, right? Mm-hmm. but the word is genos in Greek genus mm-hmm. We are God's, we are all of God's race, mm. you know, which means we're all of the one race, you know, we're all, you know, so we are of his household, we are of his lineage. Now, of course, it's not till the modern period that race theory, as we know it now, even comes into yeah. existence. It's uh-huh. a late 18th century invention. Before then, mm-hmm. the notion uh-huh. of different biological clades, I mean, race just meant different nations. Some people look different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have different customs. Uh-huh. I don't know if I want one of those people marrying my sister, but it's not thinking mm-hmm. in terms of like racial degeneration or racial mixing. That's not it. It's just they're different from us, you know. Mm-hmm. Such so as you know, bad enough in its own in its own way. But it, we haven't come to the 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 fiction of of, of you know the, the more perfidious fictions of the, the modern period that created a a pseudo scientific explanation of racial differentiation. Um, mm-hmm. Even so, um, th- there you have it. That's in the book of Acts. I mean, that's the only, you know, I mean, that, that word genos is not simply, you know, uh, simply one that you can translate in a single way. Mm-hmm. It, would, it would even say, you know, we're, we're of the same nature in some sense. Mm-hmm. God, the only reason you wouldn't use that term is nature has the notion of birth and mm-hmm. god isn't born yeah you know, so yeah yeah wow so it sounds like dr hart that there's just been a a resistance to taking some of the words of jesus seriously or the posture of uh, <laughs> christianity <laughs> seriously I think, that's a, I think that's a fair judgment about a very great yeah. deal of christian history i i, yeah. I don't think you're going to get much pushback from mm. And but but the problem is there's a there's a veneer of it. Maybe maybe there's maybe people think that they're seeing a one to one reality of the scriptures and the way of Christ and our faith. I mean, you can't be Manichaean about this, right? You can't say, "Oh well, um, all of Christendom Christendom is just the betrayal of Christianity." If that mm-hmm. were again, if that were the story, it would be a an easy problem to solve yeah. it's total yeah. cultural recusancy it's mm. well, I, this whole history is except that you and i are sitting here talking about uh social racial injustices in mm-hmm. light and economic injustices in light of the gospel presuming as we do that we're already just by virtue of being human beings who are who are in the image of the same god so mm. that we're brothers uh huh, and that we have the same dignity, mm-hmm. we should be accorded the same rights. And, That's right. And like a, if we're using the language of rights, which admittedly isn't an ancient language, but when we use, okay, we're able to do that because of a whole history of of enculturation of certain Jewish and Christian principles, mm-hmm. um, radical Christian notions of of. I mean, that obviously were always being betrayed all along the way, but even though they were being betrayed, they were being enunciated. They That's were right. shaping the consciences of cultures and of persons. 
So you, you, if you want to step back, oh, I regret Christendom. Well, then you regret human rights. Then you mm. regret the very language of of total human equity and justice, mm -hmm. and human equality, because that's simply not. You know, uh, when the word nature is used, say, by Aristotle in uh, in in De Anima to when he's uh, or elsewhere okay actually mm -hmm. the way in fact in which he he justifies slavery say now he's not thinking in terms of race in the modern sense but he says that for some persons uh it would be paraphysin outside of nature but what he means there is outside of derivation the, the word physis in greek we now use the word nature as a sort of grand metaphysical abstraction and that's mm -hmm. part of actually something that happened in the course both of Hellenistic and Christian history in which the word nature came more and more, became more and more abstract. But mm -hmm. its real meaning is offspring, race, generation. It, it's actually very close to the word genos. Mm -hmm. And what Aristotle's saying is that, um, that, that, that certain, it's just outside their, their, their line of descent, their derivation, the things are suited by but just the class they occupy in society, right? That's how I was thinking. Then you do is a Paul. Paul is using that for the same phrase, paraphysin, mm -hmm. in, um, in the book of Romans at two places, one in one where he's talking about basically, you know, sex outside of the generation, you know. Mm -hmm. But the other, the more inf important thing is when he says, you know, he uses that term regarding Jews and Gentiles. And the point he's making is that those who are, are bound to God, paraphysin, not by he's not saying you know contrary to nature that's the way it's always it's, it means outside the normal line of descent mm -hmm. gentiles don't have the privilege of being jews they can't claim for themselves the history of this covenant mm -hmm. they are from the uh, from the perspective of, of a faithful jew like paul they should be looked down on mm -hmm. whereas what he says just the opposite is that they're being grafted in from outside and then he's saying, which means you can't look down on the Jews who don't believe, mm. because of course they have that pedigree. So when they and all of Israel will be saved when they become uh, Christians, it would be it would just be if they were to, to accept Christ as the Messiah or, or Jesus as the Messiah, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be, you know, they they would simply be uh, affirming uh, an intimacy with God that they already possess by by coming from this. This, this line. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm, I'm taking an awful long time to make the point. All of that shifts, right? Um, as early as late as you know, the second century, so look at the the apostolic fellow, the Justin Martyr. Mm -hmm. We we were taught before we found the faith to fear and despise those of other other peoples, other mm -hmm. races. Again, it's not modern race theory but nonetheless they're different mm -hmm. they're other yeah mm -hmm. what we have been what we have learned is that they are uh, all one they are our, our kin our, our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. okay right so you and i can have this conversation because of this this history of christendom that for all of its all of its deviations all of mm -hmm. its betrayals of the gospel mm -hmm. at the same time preserved that language and many of those practices there's a reason why hospitals for the poor spring that's right which also alms houses that's right down the centuries faithful christians really have labored uh for mercy and justice wow um, and and so you can't separate the two histories. that's right yeah i mean historical and simply regret mm. the past mm. what you can do however and this is a, a very unsettling movement right now, is fall prey to a kind of pernicious nostalgia mm -hmm. in which you long for Christendom, but not not so much for Christianity. Mm. Is that you, you've lost sight of, it, it, it's the, um, you see this in right wing, say Catholicism in this country, because again, mm -hmm. American Catholicism is to a great deal, is to a great degree now, a kind of weird conflation of a, an old European form of, of uh -huh. conservative Catholicism, but also of a uniquely American white evangelical mm -hmm. uh, language that has infused the Catholic world. Yeah. Movement called integralism, which wants a return to sort of 16th, 
century, 17th, it was sort of Baroque throne and altar accommodation, absolute monarchy under a papal empire with rigidly defined um, social stations and ones of which women are subordinate to their husbands, mm -hmm. non-Christians uh, don't have all the rights of Christians, mm -hmm. non-Catholics don't have all the rights of other Christians. I mean, uh, this is a real move. There's a book called Integralism. You can read by two supremely depraved persons named Crayon mm -hmm. and Femister, which is, um, but of course, the ironies there are, are every bit as great as the perversities. The perversities are obvious. These are mm -hmm. tedious little authoritarian persons who, mm -hmm. who uh, have rather unwholesome psychosexual problems, as far as mm -hmm. I can tell, underlying uh -huh. their, their fantasies of domination. Mm -hmm. But but when you put all that aside, of course, is that was the reality that brought an end to Christendom. I mean, to brought an end to the, the notion of it, you know, it was precisely that that kind of thrown and altar accommodation of the absolute modern state, the absolute mon monarch. Remember, absolute monarch is also an early modern invention, the absolute uh, monarchy is not an mm -hmm. idea. evil notion, which is grounded in feudalism within the embrace of a church order, has these mitigating um, devices, independent of state. And again, it's not social justice in an ideal mm -hmm. sense, but the, the, uh -huh. there's a sort of subsidiarity at one end in which the estates are dependent upon other local competent estates and the, and another which all are under the canopy of their their baptism, so to speak. That the, the, that the church can intervene and say, no, you you, you, you can't have this. Um, now, again, I'm not saying this was a just order, but I'm saying this, the, the, the early modern order that they crave, which is a real absolute monarchy, um, and a real sort of absolutism of, of, of the central authority of, of a papal empire, which is absurd, I mean, you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. um, is itself the very the, the, the very intoler the, the actual intolerable situation that led inexorably to the collapse of the very system for which they feel this nostalgia mm. the french revolution wasn't a mistake it wasn't an accident it didn't just come about arbitrarily right it was a revolution against a very real system of power vested in the monarchy and the Gallican church. Mm. And uh, so one of these people, what does the future hold? Well, if it's nostalgia for a vanished Christendom, then it's already a prescription for the ultimate total eclipse of Christianity. Mm. Because faith cannot be saved through the coercive reestablishment of an order that was already inherently contradictory, already inherently mm -hmm. non-Christian in its principles. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. man! So the, the question I, I presented, and I, we, we talked about this on, on our emails together, is, was whether or not, you know, American Christianity and white supremacy were conjoined twins. And I think we we established that as yes. Uh, well, uh, let's let's say it's not an absolute verdict. Let's just say uh, there's been a lot of there's if if not uh, uh, well, let me put it this way: the uniquely American inflection of mm. the Christendom's perennial apostasy from the gospel is mm. one that is more deeply grounded in a history of racial injustice mm. uh -huh. than than is normally the case mm -hmm. uh, although it is the case in other lands not in not with our history and does and and at the moment the great the great counter-revolution against this realization that's going on in this incredibly anxious and increasingly frankly violent um right-wing movement mm -hmm. uh, uh, has been the suppression of that memory and mm. therefore a deeper complicity in the preservation That's of right, the structures, yeah. the structures of inequality that they don't want to confront. Mm. So that's a very long way of saying yes, <laughs> there, there is, there is a complicity there, but it, it, you can't make it a global job. I'm not yeah, saying that that's right. 
yeah. America has lots of actual Christians. Who, who are, yeah. yeah, that's right. So then I, I wonder, you know, is it possible? I'm, I'm sure it, yeah, it is possible to, to, to disentangle you know, the white supremacy ideology from the Christian faith, the American Christian faith. One hopes, mm -hmm. you know, because ultimately I think what you see is a collapse of even the pretense that this, I mean, you now actually, I, I couldn't believe this. I was just, I'm not making this up. So I, I, I too don't, uh, you say you like to read. Well, as it happens, so do I don't spend uh -huh. time online. Mm -hmm. But I do have one or two friends who torture me occasionally by sending me clips. Uh, and then I torture myself by watching them. <laughs> and it was somebody at a church in Tennessee saying, you know, we need to get away from the, the Sermon on the Mount form of Christianity right mm. now. What we, what we need is something more like uh you know um the 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 warlike um language of of conquering canaan and you know um that's a little disturbing I, I had never i had never heard a person who is alleging himself to be a christian before I'd actually never say we need to get we, right now we need to put the sermon on the mount aside. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been doing it for centuries, don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no one's just sort of consciously yeah. explicitly saying that, you know, now isn't the time to love your your, your enemies. Mm. Now isn't the time. Uh and you have to wonder, is that does that foreshadow a larger cultural in which in which this sort of this this cultural identity of white evangelicalism becomes more and more consciously, more and more explicitly detached from even the uh, appearance of a devotion to Christian principles. Is there not, you know, is there a point at which, you know, you say, well, <laughs> turn the other cheek. What mm. loser said that? You know, mm. which I, I'm still waiting for Donald Trump to say that in an interview. <laughs> uh, of course, he's a person who's never read the Bible. And so, mm. so uh, um, so he's quite capable of, of, of that. I'm just waiting for it mm. because I know that if he said it, it would not make a difference mm. with his evangelical supporters. Wow. Um, uh, so in light of this history, what does the Christian way look like today? Narrow, I think. <laughs> it's curiously enough, it's probably a very narrow path. I, I look, I mean, there has to come a point where you say, well, you know, you just have to devote yourself to love and justice. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. But I'll tell you this, if it has a, a political or a cultural expression, it's not going to be the renewal of Christendom mm. as it existed, nor should we want it to be. Mm -hmm. That, that well, as I say, it's not something to be lamented and rejected uh, on there, because frankly, there would be no memory of Christ at all, of his words. Mm -hmm. It would certainly not have formed the consciences of millions and billions of persons you know, over, over the generations. It would not mm -hmm. have had what effect it has had for the good. That's right, uh, yeah. You know, we would not be talking about, you know, we wouldn't have conversations about the social welfare net and if, mm -hmm. the, if we weren't already conscious of, of something that, that that uh well we find in the prophets of israel but you know in the very in very radical form in the in the early church which is itself sort of an attempt to recover the language of jeremiah and isaiah from a period of uh, you know the, the, where the institutional realities according to christ were betraying the tradition of the law and the prophet um as every culture does uh so but the future is not going to be a recovery of that. The yeah. only way in which, I mean, this sort of theocratic fantasy of integralism is is not only childish and evil, it, it is ultimately just deeply stupid. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's like you might as well be fantasizing about benevolent extraterrestrials arriving to life. <laughs> <laughs> and which is far more likely, which, you know, uh -huh. you know th that could happen. The other can, mm -hmm. we, we can. I, I think, uh, if if we want to talk about Christianity and culture, we have to argue for a late antique cosmopolitanism. 
that is mm. in the sense of, I don't know if you've ever studied say stoicism or, or late antique philosophy but this notion of the cosmopolis that we all belong to one city one people one you know mm. we're, well that's very much you know and keep uh, there's a reason why the early christians borrowed a lot of their ethical language from stoicism yeah you know, um, and paul you know this is clearly paul's vision. paul was not is it, you know you have to understand he may you know paul was no he was not a champion of conquest or anything but mm. at the same time he was not neither was he an enemy of the notion of the empire as a a sort of global uh community mm. i mean obviously this the, at least if we're to take seriously his own words and the words uh and, and the, the depiction we have as fictionalized as it may be in the book of acts mm -hmm is he has this notion of a conversion of the empire mm. in not in the way that ultimately happened but as as a genuine sort of cosmopolitanism in which all you know are are uh recognizable to one another as belonging to a single kindred because they they were reborn in a single font they shared mm. a single loaf of bread as he puts uh -huh. it yeah and and that shared love of course there's a eucharistic language there but also remember the eucharist at that time isn't something separate from a common meal so it's also mm -hmm. the, the image of the bread the artos bread or loaf of bread that he's talking about is also just the, the basic stuff of life that we all mm -hmm. share together mm -hmm. that the only christianity that, that, that should have a claim on the future that's actually christian rather than just another grotesque caricature invented by another yet another distorted ideology would be that sort of cosmopolitan vision of of rather than uh you know of of all peoples in 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 free and harmonious difference together you know, my, my notion of a, of a Christian Europe, for instance, would not be one in which we've uh, in which we've built countless more churches mm -hmm. and had a, a a theocratic regime imposing uh, uh, faith tests on those who want to aspire to full citizenship. It mm -hmm. would be actually be one in which there'd be a great deal more temples and mosques, mm -hmm. gurdwaras, uh, synagogues. As mm -hmm. well as churches, and be one that really is open to the entirety of the world. Wow! Uh, another word for that, by the way, is civilization. But we can get into mm -hmm. that in a different time. But I mean, a Christian yeah. civilization would be mm -hmm. radically cosmopolitan. Um, and it's. I mean, I know, as for you know practicality, that I can't say anything about. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. like I know how one could achieve that end. Yeah. I do know that that's an end that I think is genuinely a Christian vision. Mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. Well, that's helpful. And even if you don't know the steps to getting somewhere, at least you can Im possibly imagine, you know, where, where how well, this could look. <laughs> if you can find it on the map, mm -hmm. you know, then the question of which terrains you might have to cross to get to it become mm -hmm. nothing else is clarified. Yeah. Uh, but if on the map, you know, you're heading out for a completely different kingdom, some theocratic fantasy of, 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 of uh, integralist uh, Christendom, then, then of course, you have no hope of getting anywhere at all. Well, I appreciate that. And so if, if, I, if I'm just kind of freshly coming onto this, this conversation and I'm exposed to your work for the first time, what is a book that I should read first? Maybe that will dialogue with some of these issues we discuss, but maybe just ultimately ground me more in my Christianity. What is a book that I can read by you? What, 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 by me? <laughs> by, by you, me? by you. Oh, you, see, you see, grounding people in their, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a pastoral writer. Oh, so yeah, very yeah. Good at that sort of, uh -huh. of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, on the issue of Christendom, I wrote some years ago a book that was given a title I don't like. It was called Atheist Delusions, but mm -hmm. I call it the Christian Revolution. With I'm sorry, I keep hitting the microphone. I, I'd okay. get fined if this were a real <laughs> professional studio. Uh -huh. um, 
which, if nothing else, rehearses some of the history that I've been talking about. Yes, um, uh-huh. I'm thinking of writing a book. Uh, I can't I can't use the ter- the title Cosmopolis, which is the one I'd want because Stephen mm-hmm. Tolman wrote a book with that title, and I don't want mm-hmm. the two to be confused. Mm-hmm. I'm sure others have used it too. Um, uh, including Witold Gombrowicz, the, the, the famous uh, uh, Polish novelist, but hey, that's a different issue. Okay. Um, this is going to sound a bit, uh, if you want, uh, my sense of how one should see the world, um, and this is going to sound to those who know the book, like I'm saying something facetious, but I'm not. <laughs> I have a book called Roland in Moonlight, which if mm. nothing else uh, is a clue to the sort of sensibility I believe in. But I'm afraid, yeah. That would um, be helpful. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't have the sort of, I don't write the sort of. Um, although I, I would say that the second edition of my translation of the New Testament, if nothing else, mm. actually does deal with a lot of the issues we're talking mm. about because it has a critical apparatus. And I tried to translate, for instance, I tried to translate the Sermon on the Mount uh-huh. in a way that brings it. Uh, mm-hmm. But there are a lot of footnotes there, and a lot of uh, both the introduction and the af- yes. and the uh, material at the end, the appendices that actually, mm-hmm. curiously enough, deal with these things. So I guess that's the closest I've come to writing yeah. a book that, that might be apposite to this conversation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be sharing that at the end of the video. Yes. Your so your your translation of the New Testament in the second edition in particular. Second edition. Yeah. Second, second edition. Yes, second edition. I, uh, yes. I, I, I improved. There were certain things um, I was trying when I did the translation not to fall into the pattern of the, just those sorts of translations I told you about mm-hmm. in which those were really the striking or the odd things about the text yeah. are hidden behind a, a more mollifying sort mm-hmm. of tra- uh, so, so, sort of rendering, like, you know, forgive us our trespasses rather than mm-hmm. get us out of our debts, which mm-hmm. is what the, the, the prayer is actually saying. It's, it's, literally people who are being crushed by debt in Galilee and in the Judean mm-hmm. countryside. And, um, but there, in other places, I realized I was still falling into the patterns in other places. And, some, and so the second edition, I think, improves on, okay. on that. So that, that's what I would ask everyone in future to buy. Okay. It's not and out should, yet. If you want to buy the first, no, it's it's been out for a while. It's been out. For okay, a while. okay, okay, very good. Okay. The, the first, uh, first, you can buy the first edition too if you want to contribute more to my royalties. <laughs> let, let me share this. I, I have a at, at my faith community. We meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays for Lectio Divina, and I have a buddy. He often cites your translation as we're meditating on the scriptures together. <laughs> so uh, he's a good man. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll let him know. I'll be, he's a big fan of your work, so he would really appreciate listening to this conversation. His name is Daryl Schaefer. So, so well, I like uh, Daryl. Yeah, I like the name Daryl too. <laughs> yeah. If I had Dr. a cat, name <laughs> a cat named Daryl, huh? I think I think Daryl would be a good name for us, <laughs> don't you? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's dignity, but also a kind of yeah. slight aloofness because Daryl isn't a. It's like Reginald. Reginald is a good mm-hmm. name, I think, for, mm-hmm. for a cat as well. Mm-hmm. C- Cecilia, uh, that would be for a female. Cat. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, that's Hart, what I, we should have been talking about. Too. <laughs> just I'll, cats, I'll yeah. Go. Just cat names. No, no. I, I'm names. just. I want to honor your time. I know that um, time is valuable, and I, I appreciate your your words and your thoughts. I think a lot of this conversation is going to be like a initiating moment for many people, maybe to go out and. Um, ask more questions and discover more. So I, I appreciate you presenting we are, a lot. But we, are, we are at a perilous moment mm. culturally in the world. I mean, mm-hmm. there are very sinister forces on the rise. That's and right. And a lot of people um, who've allied themselves to those forces, though they themselves are not evil persons, mm. have been beguiled mm-hmm. by, by lies. That's right. And... Um, and uh, here, not just here, but but uh, in in much of the uh, much of the world, and um, 
so yeah, it's a, it. Uh, if there's a moment for the you know the raising of consciousness, uh, mm -hmm. I was born in the '60s, so I see you know uh -huh. getting the groove. Yeah, <laughs> there's a moment. Uh, um, th this this is a good moment to start thinking seriously about this. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I, I thank you so much for your work in ra raising the consciousness <laughs> and your, contrib well, uh, your contribution to, to raising that consciousness. Well, well thank you for, for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. And the weather's beautiful, so I'm going to go yeah. walk my dog. Yeah, it's beautiful here, too. So, yeah. so Where are you, you, by the way? By the way? I'm in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm a I'm a youth pastor at a church. And you um, may have told me that already, but my I'm, no, I, I, you know, at no. my age, memory begins to yeah be a be something you remember having had. Uh -huh. I remember remembering. I remember uh -huh. what remembering felt like. So, uh huh. Okay. All right. Well, well, take care. God bless you too. God bless you. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this conversation in its entirety. If you would like to continue thinking about how uh, David Bentley Hart thinks and his approach to the faith, I would encourage you to check out some of these resources. The first is his blog. He has a blog on Substack and you can access that blog by going to davidbentleyhart.substack.com. Again, that's davidbentleyhart.substack.com and you can sign up for his blog and you can receive um, more content from him. And there's a couple of books I would recommend along with the books that he brought up. The first is that, that all shall be saved, um, heaven, hell, and universal salvation. So this is just his take on um, these very important uh, matters of the faith. So you can check this book out. It's on, available on Amazon or wherever you can buy a book. And then further, he talked about the atheist delusions in, in our conversation. So you can check that out. That's also available wherever you can buy books. And then Another book he recommended is Rolling in Moonlight. Uh, again, this is another book you can buy anywhere. And then lastly, he recommended and cited his New Testament translation. Um, Dr. Hart is a, a tedious and a, um, uh, an important scholar that has done a lot of tedious work. And so I, I recommend you check out this, this, this translation of the New Testament and any of these books, I know any of these books may be benefit to you and a helpful resource for you as you're trying to explore important questions of the faith. And then lastly, if you would like to support my work and what I'm trying to do on this channel, um, one way you can do that is by checking out my music. I'm a hip hop artist. I make a lot of music. And um, so all my music are streaming on all platforms. It's, it's hip hop, like I said, so it may not be for you, but it could be for you. So um, my latest EP is That's What I Thought. And I had an EP I re released in the beginning of this year called I'm Sorry, Are You God? And this is my attempt to wrestle with some of the things of my faith and some of my um, engagement with um, Christianity. So you can, like I said, you can check this out on just about any streaming platform. And that would be a, a very helpful way for you to support the work on this channel. That's all I have. Thank you for listening. Um, blessings to your day and blessings to your journey. Be fooled. This Jesus you've heard about is not who they say he is. He did not come to start wars and draw swords. He came to serve. He did not come to condemn sinners. He came to heal and empower them. He did not come to start a religion. He came to universalize God experience so that even the powerless can experience the love of their Creator. He did not come to confront the hungry. is not just for the good of political progressives to justify is not a political pawn to be used to justify our grasping for power not jesus is the light god's kingdom is for all not just america not just god's kingdom is for all of the earth not just heaven and this is not a kingdom of control and might but sacrifice